Good morning. It is so great to see you in worship today. My name is Maggie Dunaway, and I serve alongside Reverend Robert Mercer, who is preaching in traditional today, and Reverend Dr. Bill Morgan on the pastoral team. And along with the worship team, we are so excited to have you in worship today at Asbury on this beautiful Palm Sunday morning. Here at our church, we believe that Everyone has value to God, is loved to God by God, and so everyone has something special to bring. So let's bring our best and give our best to God in worship and praise of Him today. Don't forget that Asbury Engage is the last Sunday of the month after worship. So if you're interested in knowing more about how we worship, serve, and grow here at Asbury, or you want to join Asbury, just be sure and let us know. And we'd love for you to come and have lunch with us and learn a little bit more about the church. Um, be in prayer for our sixth grade confirmations. I think you heard Amy mention, and it's clear she's never been there before, but she said, June Alaska. It's more like June Alaska, but be sure and be in prayer for them. They're on their way home today, and they actually got up there to Lake June Alaska in North Carolina, and it snowed on them. So I know they have had a really exciting but weird spring week, so be in prayer for them as they drive home today. Uh, as we open our worship with prayer, I invite you to pause together Place your hands in your lap, palms up in an expression of openness to Christ. And let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, we take our first steps into Holy Week today, following your Son in the lead. God, help us to open our minds and spirits up to what Palm Sunday means for us all. A time to recognize our Sovereign Father, but not to forget the self-denial and sacrifice He gave for our world. Lord, we ask You to continue to walk with those who are hurting, impoverished, lonely, alone, sick. God, those who are just struggling, help us find ways to be beacons of your light to all your children, especially those in need. I pray each heart present would not only hear the good news, but begin to experience the good news. To feel your love so fully that it overflows into their world and out into the people they meet. We pray these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. He gave us these words to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we open our first song, I want to invite any children, any kids who are in the room to go to the back and see Miss Savannah. If you haven't already picked up a palm, and as we worship in our first song today, they're going to have a Palm Sunday parade. Will you stand and worship with us in praise to God?
storm surrounding me
now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands And this is my confidence
Today's scripture reading is from the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel, verses 19 through 40. After Jesus said this, he continued on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As Jesus came to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave two disciples a task. He said, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you will find tied up there is a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. Those who had been sent found it exact, exactly as he had said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, Its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clothes on the colt, and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, they spread their clothes on the road. As Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They prayed God with a loud voice because of all the mighty things they had seen. They said, Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. He answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Here in the bridge, children are always welcome for the entire service. Our kids' ministry does offer a children's church for K through second graders. If you would like to be part of that ministry, you can meet Miss Savannah in the back of that room and in the, in the back of the room, and she will walk with you to room 214. So we're closing in on the final weeks of our series, God Moves Us. We've journeyed through much of the gospel of Luke with Jesus during this time of Lent. Today we explore how God can move us in faithful directions as we take our first steps through the doors of Jerusalem. Today's gospel lesson is all about movement. After all, there's a parade. Despite the misplaced expectations of the Jewish people then, and often of us today, Jesus propels this redemption story forward in sovereignty, self-denial, and sacrifice that can move us into more faithful followers if we allow it to. So it's a humbling and honestly kind of refreshing thing to realize that you've heard a scripture for years, but you've essentially missed something, no matter how many times you've heard it or read it. Or maybe that's not quite it. Maybe it's just that I had developed in my mind this picture of what Palm Sunday was supposed to look like. Revolves around a worship service that opens with adorable children, of course, walking and waving palm branches to mimic the followers of Jesus. It's the one time of year in a traditional setting where the whole choir processes in instead of staying in their stationary place, all the while singing Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. In churches across the world, Palm Sunday involves this bright glimpse of post-resurrection joy and the pageantry of a parade. It's beautiful. It's moving. I love it. I love the tradition of it. There's nothing wrong with it. But I wonder if I've glossed over the reality of what it cost Jesus to be the kind of king he is in this moment. 
In my imagination, Jesus' entry into the city has become more kind of like a red carpet Hollywood award show with palm tree lined streets, or maybe the procession of the manicured royals as they drive through the streets of London when one of their own is going to get married. Lots of pomp, lots of circumstance, lots of pretty people. Like the Jewish people, my expectations of Christ became those of my world, not of his. The followers of Jesus were not well-to-do. They were not the upper crust. They were sick, poverty-stricken, outcasts, people on the very fringe of society. The cloaks that Luke describes that they threw down, they wouldn't have been fancy garments. They would have been worn rags with holes and grime, stuff that you and I would have thrown away in a heartbeat. Picture a large group of homeless people in downtown Birmingham all gathered together shouting and singing and chanting for a leader to unite them. Now I can only look honestly at what my reaction to a gathering like that would be. And I'm not proud of it. The Jews wanted Christ to be a warring king who would alleviate their suffering under Roman oppression. I just want him and his followers to look and act like me. Part of allowing God to move us in a more faithful direction is removing those expectations, stepping outside of those expectations, our desire to place him in this box that we have made. Now, right off the bat, you might have noticed something about Luke's version of Palm Sunday. There's actually no palm branches, no hosannas whatsoever, no little children gathered around Christ. It could be called Cloak Sunday, maybe Donkey Sunday, because that's really what Luke focuses on. The movement of Christ toward the cross has taken nearly 10 chapters of Luke, and it's kind of skipped around in terms of what happens. But now, beginning with this event in Holy Week, we go through real time with Christ to the cross. Each character in Luke's version acts in faithful obedience to make this entry possible and to point toward the unique sovereignty of our Christ. So Jesus has been traveling, we're assuming by foot, all around the countryside, healing, preaching, and teaching. But in order to enter Jerusalem, he decides he needs the ancient day equivalent of an Uber, a donkey. Why the sudden need for a lift in the city? Why not just walk? Evidence points to the fulfillment of prophecy that is mentioned in the ninth chapter of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he tells two of his unnamed disciples to go find this certain young donkey that has never been ridden. And truthfully, I never got to the bottom of that particular uh, mystery. And bring it to him to ride. Now, the disciples probably don't realize that this donkey is part of a greater cosmic plan by God to save the world. They likely think they're being made to make a Starbucks run. So eyes rolling... Nonetheless, they oblige in obedience to Christ. They tell the perplexed owners of the donkey, owners of the donkey, (laughs) doesn't belong to Christ, that they're going to take the donkey, its master needs it. Now, donkeys were seen, seen as a very humble animal, an animal that a leader would ride in in peace, not after a war. Now, as polite Christians, we really like to focus on this humility angle. But Jesus is actually making a bold statement 
in choosing this animal. Passover is a festival to remember and celebrate how the Jewish people were liberated from oppression, were given freedom from the Egyptians. Now, during a festival like Passover where Jewish people would be all in the city, all over the city, Pontius Pilate and other Roman rulers would ride through the streets on their stallions, followed by all their military might to signal their authority, to remind the Jews, hey, we'll allow you to remember your past freedom, but you're still under our rule. Christ's entry is a stark contrast to this imperialism. It's almost, you could say, a parody or a mockery of the authority of Roman rule. He strives for peace, but he makes a political and societal statement here. I am your king, but I'm not that kind of king. He rides the donkey into Jerusalem and his temporarily enthusiastic followers, they lay down cloaks, they throw down cloaks in front of him, really just items of clothing as a sign of homage to royalty. They chant familiar words that we recall from the birth narrative at the very beginning of Luke. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Well, the Pharisees quickly become uncomfortable with this swell of support because it disrupts this very carefully calculated and fragile peace they have with Roman forces who allow them to practice their faith, but, you know, as long as it doesn't disrupt the status quo. So they tell Jesus, can you just tell your followers to pipe down? He says, I couldn't make them be quiet even if I tried. And if they were, then God's creation, even the very stones on the ground, would cry out. Now, the Bible is full of metaphors of all kinds of inanimate objects praising the Creator. The sun, the moon, stars, heaven, water, sky. The part about the rocks originally sounded really far-fetched to me, but then I remembered this news story came out a couple of years ago about the fact that rocks in our solar system actually make noise. They're singing all the time. We just can't hear it. It's more like some sort of reverberation, but there have been recordings from the Voyager mission and other missions. God's creation is full of praise for him, and we're just one tiny part of it. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. Recognizing the sovereign God should move us to faithful obedience like the donkey like the disciples, like the rocks. Easier said than done. Maybe we can step outside ourselves for just a moment, long enough to remember that God's will was made apparent for us in the living body of Christ. Bold and loving, stepping forward in the brightness of Palm Sunday for what he believed in, which was us. So Jesus demonstrates this sovereignty in the very beginning and also the fact as he faces the crowd that he's able to deny the self and continue to love these people. The multitude of disciples who will turn on him in mere days. Were Jesus any other ruler or heck, any other person, he would just pause and stop in this moment just to revel in the cheers of the crowd. Just to listen to that love that they're chanting and reciting for him. Even though he knows it won't be long before they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. The word bandwagon, who I think these people might have coined, was actually termed in the U.S. in the mid-19th century. Uh, I believe P.T. Barnum, Phineas T. Barnum, who was the famous showman and leader of the circus, coined that term originally, and it was really just something that he called the circus band wagon. 
Now the term jumping on the bandwagon then became a part of our vernacular when politicians picked up on the fact that they could ride around the country and campaign from a wagon and attract followers who would then vote for them. Real life example, I have not attended one class at Duke Divinity School yet, but I jumped on that bandwagon and yelled at that TV like I was a true blue fan watching them lose to the Tar Heels. But I may jump off now that Coach K is retiring. We would like to think most people aren't as fickle as I am. We would like to think that those followers of Christ in Jerusalem on that day weren't as fickle as I am but it's likely that they were. He tried to demonstrate to them a different kind of kingship, different than anything that they'd ever known. He's healed the broken and restored them to community. He's forgiven those who've wandered outside the realm of societal and religious standards, the sinners in their society. He's repeatedly lifted up and included Whoever among us is the least of these, they hope instead he's the one who will finally raise up an army and overthrow their oppressors in a violent show of force. Now there's no blame here, hear me, for their hope. Wouldn't we want the same? Physical, emotional, financial release from oppression that has followed the people around since the days of Abraham. We can't blame them for what they want, but it's impossible for them to see the big picture. The freedom that God offers is not just for the few, but it's for all of us, for you and for me, to experience grace and forgiveness and love. I read a comment by an Episcopal priest. His name is Rick Morley. He said, Palm Sunday is just a little microcosm of Jesus' ministry. The brief attention of a multitude, which quickly leads to the rejection by that same multitude. To brave that takes a huge heart. To brave that and still be in love with those who reject him Well, that's just amazing. Where is our heart movement? Where's our heart movement toward those who reject us or those who we love and reject? Do we unite our voices together in the Lord's Prayer today, but turn around and hang on to a grudge with dear life as we move forward? Do we find ourselves lost in the beauty and the wonder of the music and praise we've heard today, but spew judgment the next day when someone doesn't meet the standards we think that they should? Being moved in faithfulness takes more than waving palms and singing hosannas. So Christ's sovereignty, his self-denial, But then the ultimate motivator for us to seek a more faithful existence is his sacrificial love. In the 18th chapter of Luke, he tells the 12, Look, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything written about me by the prophets will happen. I'll be handed over to the Gentiles. I will be ridiculed, mistreated, spit on. After being tortured, they will kill me. On the third day, I will rise up. Each moment brings Christ closer to this reality. Now, this is not sacrifice just for the sake of nothing, but because Jesus entered the world, saw the need, and was moved to tears by it. He isn't some kind of robot who goes through the motions of prophecy to his death. Certainly, he continued to hope that people would see the alternate reality, the life that he offered, 
and that perhaps there would be a different ending to this story. But it was and is still so vastly different from the world that we knew, from the world that they knew. A world of success, of winning at all costs. They couldn't see it, and so many times neither do we. At the end of the day, Christ is brutally killed by man, not by his father. He is naturally moved and saddened by the events that will come to pass. In the very next passage after this triumphant entry, Jesus weeps over the city, Jerusalem, that he knows will fall. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. He came to his own and his own received him not. And Jesus, human and divine, is moved to sadness and tears. Christ came to earth to show us who God really is. What no king can be, no leader, no president, a savior. There's a film, it's one of my favorites, I think it was made in the late 90s, Saving Private Run. And it's loosely based on a true story. If you haven't seen it, if you're not familiar with it, you should. But in the opening scene, we learned that three men, all with the last name Ryan, have died in battle in the Normandy invasion. And that their mother, who is back in the United States, in one day will receive word that three of her four children have died. Now, it's based on the U.S. War Department's sole survivor policy, which was adopted in the 1940s, after four brothers serving in the Navy all died during the Battle of Guadalcanal, that the Army will find that remaining child, release them from the military, and bring them home. So, Private First Class James Francis Ryan is the center of the story, and the bulk of the movie follows a U.S. captain, Captain Miller, played by the very talented Tom Hanks, and his squad as they venture deep into Nazi territory to locate this young private to get him home safely to his parents. There's a graphic but very moving battle scene toward the end as Private Ryan tries to protect his bridge that he's guarding and the rest of the squad is helping but they're attacked by Nazis. They win but at great cost several of the members of the squad die and Captain Miller is fatally wounded. There's a look on Tom Hanks face. As he looks up he sees planes flying over where they are. They're American fighter planes that signal to him the rescue of the remainder of his squad and ensure Private Ryan's safety to America, but too late for him. It's a look that is difficult to express. It's tinged with this hope for the future but also with a tragic sadness of what he won't see. I think it represents many moments of our life and time that we hold, that we hold equally together, that bear both joyful and just extraordinarily painful times at one time, that we can experience both those things together. I wonder if Christ had a mixture of that same look on his face as the gates of Jerusalem swung open and he rode forward on a donkey. Amidst the clapping, the cheering, the praising from those whose life have been changed by him, did his eyes betray what he knew would happen? 
Palm Sunday is a bright spot of rightful praise. But if we miss the tender pain of Jesus' journey, we risk forgetting what he went through to secure peace and glory for mankind. To follow him into Jerusalem, we look to his sovereignty, his self-denial, and his sacrifice. Captain Miller's final words to Private Ryan are, earn this, earn this life. Christ ensured there is nothing that we have to do to earn his love and grace. But I pray today that we are moved to want to earn it anyway. That we are open to the change that he can put forth in our lives by his example. If not, we look closely and we see ourselves among the multitude of followers who praised Christ one day but quickly turn their backs on that message of love. We will fail him over and over and over. But let's look toward that example and be moved by it. Leave this place changed, having experienced Christ today. Let us pray. Gracious Father, lead us forward from this place today. Help us to become different people. Live different lives that are molded by this love that you so graciously pour into us. You are our King and our Savior, even in those moments when we don't recognize you, when we try to conform you to the kind of Savior that we want you to be. God, just help us step outside of ourselves and see you and the mercy and grace and love that you so freely give. God, we love you. As we go forward into Holy Week, let us walk with you. Let us experience what you experienced, the pain, and ultimately the triumph and the joy of resurrection in our lives. We love you. We praise you, God, in all things. Amen.
Amen. Gosh, these guys are talented. Thank you. Thank you. So glad you were here today. I pray this week that you experience the good news. That you don't just hear it with your mind, but you live it out in your very soul. Go from this place now without any shame, timidity, or fear. Love the Sovereign Lord. Go now in peace. Amen.